unprecedented unprecedented session for us. We have rather than just you know one person, several folks to to chat with here. We have 143 participants so far, and uh, I. I, for those who don't know me, I'm a, I'm a Plato mentor. I'm a, you know a early Google product manager, and then I've been doing product and engineering uh, management roles ever since for the last 15 or so years. Um, and uh, we've had sessions like this, you know, with again a lot of great folks from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, as you have questions, pose them in the Q and A at the bottom, and then upvote any questions that you think are relevant and interesting. I'll generally go from top to bottom, acknowledging that I'll be moderating as well. So if there's anything. Anything awkward not to ask, you know, I won't ask it. Um, other than that, though, I'd love to, to intro to the group. So we have Eric, Darren, Gila, Christy, Mech, and Christopher here. So we're, we're going to do a little bit of a quick round of introductions. So uh, Eric, we'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, David. I'm uh, Eric Johnson. I'm the Executive Vice President of Engineering at GitLab. I've been here a little over two and a half years, and my total team size is about 530. We've actually got four or five uh, employees in uh, Play-Doh having a good experience with their, their mentors. I wanted to mention that. And um, I brought five of my colleagues here just because one of our core values is collaboration. And there's lots of people in different functional areas or just happen to have different perspectives on um, uh, all the topics we're gonna talk about today. So I'm happy to run point on anything. I'll occasionally shell out to one of them if I think it's a fit for their functional area or if I just happen to know they've got a great perspective on something. Or as David said, you're welcome to address questions to them directly and they can, uh, they can field those. So that Darren. Awesome, thanks Eric. I'm Darren, head of remote at GitLab. I've been here almost a year and boy, it feels like about a hundred years uh, in the world of remote. So if you go to allremote.info, you'll see our remote playbook, which I was the lead author on, and we have dozens of guides on how we think about all things remote, uh, and that is linked in the shared Google Doc. Remote is my favorite topic. Uh, it's incredible to see the global shift to it and the global embrace, uh, and Sid has often said, never waste a crisis. We can't wish away the crisis, but we can choose how we respond to it, and it's very encouraging to see companies embracing remote and the flexibility around it. So happy to be here and happy to answer any questions related to remote. All right, next, Gila. Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Gila. I joined GitLab in last December. So in a way, I'm the least experienced remote manager here. Uh, it's, it's good and bad. The bad is I may not have the best tips yet. The, the good thing is I'm experiencing a lot of the pain point you are going through now. So those are fresh. Um, my team here has, uh, we have six product managers. So we focused on the product growth. Um, before GitLab, I worked at a company called Acorns, leading their growth team as well. So happy to answer and help in any way I can. Christy? Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Linneville. I'm GitLab's uh, Director of User Experience. I've been with the company for a little over a year now. Uh, in that time, we've grown from a team of 16 to about 60. So just incredible growth over the last year. And my team includes product design, UX research, and technical writing. Uh, before GitLab, I led UX teams at a company called HEB, which is kind of regional. You may not have heard of that, but I also led uh, UX at Rackspace, and that was a hybrid remote team. So uh, I definitely have the perspective between hybrid remote and all remote. Awesome. Mech? Thank you for that. Hi, I'm Mech Titri, Director of Quality Engineering. I've been with GitLab for around two years. Uh, my team consists of um, engineering productivity engineers and also uh, software engineers and tests. I've jumped around multiple startups. Um, most of my discipline and habits come from VMware, where I spent um, around five years there uh, working on test automation and everything else um, in regards to quality. Um, back to you. Cool. Christopher? Yes, uh, my name is Christopher Leffoltz. I'm the Senior Director of Development, so managing most of the software engineers in the company. Uh, I started just over uh, 15 months ago. Uh, I started on the 22nd, which is also a release date, uh, so that's how it's easy to remember. Um, previous to here, I was at various uh, technology companies, most of them large-scale large, uh, large -scale companies, uh, and have been working remotely off and on for probably about eight years now. Uh, so it's been uh, uh, Jeff, definitely a journey of seeing how the technology has changed over, say, the last 25 years and definitely enjoying uh, the fact that technology has enabled this kind of thing. 
Excellent. This is great. We have actually a, a, a nice holistic, you know, folks that have been doing the remote thing for a while. Folks are kind of new to it, like the whole range. It, it reminds me, you know, in like user experience land, they talk about heuristic analyses of user interfaces. And there's a lot of research that shows that those who are experts identify different things from those who are intermediates and those who are novice. So the point is, is that as a quote unquote novice, you're actually going to see quite a lot of things that other people aren't going to see. I mean, that applies to lots of things in life, but particularly to this remote thing. We have Folks that have been used to this for a while may have some blindness to some some challenges, right? So all perspectives welcome. So with that, I'm going to dive into questions. So we actually are going to have a lot of questions. So I'm going to encourage a general time boxing of like a couple minutes or so per question, and you know we'll have a little bit of back and forth if things need to get extended. So starting with this first one, already has 16 upvotes. How do we best guide employees to high productivity without falling into the trap of being on around the clock? and risking burnout or work fatigue. So Eric, this is definitely one that I think a lot of people think about when there's, you know, not as much of a separation between work and life, you know, there's this whole work-life integration thing. So here you Yeah, this is definitely uh, really important. And so um, I would say um, in terms of being on around the clock, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're a really distributed organization. So we try to work asynchronously whenever possible. And that means people can work on a, an item document an issue or in our handbook or something like that and then hopefully hand it off to someone who's awake as they're going to sleep and the work can kind of follow the sun without people needing to be up uh, all the time we also really don't favor meetings we do them but we do them after async has kind of failed us and we need a different mode to work and be successful um, and you know because that, that's a big question we get from managers like how am I going to work at this company without being up all the time and being doing doing calls with with India and Austria and Australia on the same day and the answer is, you know, do as, as few meetings as possible and make them optional whenever, uh, whenever possible. Um, burnout is the other aspect here. And that's something that I, I found notable about being a remote manager for the first time. And I've done it at a couple companies now. The signs of burnout for employees are really hidden. When you're in the same office together, um, you see someone dragging a little bit. You see someone showing up a couple minutes late to the stand up and you, you kind of know and you can have those conversations in a one-on-one. -on -one. You typically don't see those signals as much when you're managing remote employees. And so we encourage people to be um, managers of one. We have that in our handbook, like manage your own time. We really encourage people to take breaks. Um, but maybe this is a good thing for, for Christopher to jump in and lend his perspective because he's got more, more than half people on my team are on Christopher's team. And development is we, re we really use a lot of productivity metrics. And, so, and I know he's thinking a lot about um, we're seeing higher productivity, but we are concerned about burnout right now. So Christopher, what are you, what are you thinking? Yeah, a, a few things come to mind. So one is, is uh, there's different types of burnout. So there's the burnout of being on a clock all the time, and then there's working uh, excessive hours, and the, we need to distinguish between those two. I think the way we handle uh, most of the on around the time is having clear communication guidelines and also being clear about what hours we're expecting people to be kind of available. Uh, and we allow employees to set their own hours based on where they live at time zone wise. So that's a clear aspect. Uh, you'll see a lot of people turn off notifications for uh, Slack as an example, which is a policy we have um, here at GitLab. And uh, depending on what you feel is the need of your organization, that's kind of the trade off you have to make uh, associated with that. Uh, the other thing you call it is, is volume of work, which is, you know, it's really important to kind of think about. And what we try to emphasize is, is really thinking in terms of, of uh, productivity. So we're not concerned about how many hours you're working. We're concerned about the results associated with that and measuring yourself. So you can pick certain metrics. In our case, our favorite metric is MRs, and we evaluate based on that. And we do it as a team goal, not as an individual goal. So the idea is to basically push the team to think about it, how to be more efficient and effective associated with it. Um, if we see team members who are uh, in a situation where it's more, then that's one thing that we'll keep an eye on. Are they doing it because they enjoy it or is it because they're honestly feeling like they have an obligation and then we'll try to figure out how to break the work out. Um, last thought is uh, right now, productivity for a lot of companies who are remote are, is up. Um, the reason why is because people aren't taking week, week vacations like they would normally do during this time period. Uh, so it's something to also keep in mind is, is that you may see a lull uh, coming out of this when we start to open back up around it. Fascinating. So this is interesting to hear. I mean, it certainly makes sense that asynchronous communication is, is a necessity and that that's, that's kind of one way to allow people to have their own time and kind of come and go from, from work. At the same time, I have heard some folks say that, uh, you know, they've had more meetings than they otherwise would during this time because they've needed to have more check-ins, more connection, more uh, touch points to be able to tell how people are, are doing. And hearing Eric, you, you mentioning the, the concern that 
oftentimes you can't really tell, you know, certain signs of, of burnout. Um, how can you maintain that connection, you know, acknowledging everybody is asynchronous and remote um, without, you know, having a significant number of meetings? Yeah, and I think that, um, that impulse to want to check in is, is hopefully something that's going to dissipate over time as more people work remote and they, they understand that they and, and their peers can be successful. I have heard that um, so, sort of corporate spy software, they're, they're selling a lot of software right now, we've, we've heard. Uh, I think that's an understandable instinct for managers that are used to relying on being in the office together. But again, hopefully that, that dissipates over time as they learn they can trust people. Um, but in terms of maintaining that connection, um, you know, we encourage things like uh, coffee breaks, meaning a Zoom call that's purely just to talk about like, how is your family doing? How's my family doing? What's going on in the world? Those sorts of things. Um, we've also started uh, juice box calls. So we encourage people with, now that their kids are home to get on with their kids and let the kids interact with one another and things like that. And um, we were a company that um, kind of getting back to more work related stuff. We don't do things like all hands for the most part, but every morning there's what we call a group conversation. And it's effectively an all hands, like some functional leader gives uh, you know, a, a five minute update about what they're doing. And then hopefully we get right into a rich group of, of questions from people. And so it's a good way to kind of stay in touch uh, with the rest of the organization because you can't rely on, you know, as I say, like things are never overheard at GitLab. You only know what you ask or what people think to push to you. Um, you're not marinating in the same culture, the same building together. You're not having lunch table conversations where serendipitous things are said or heard. So you have to create some of those things uh, synthetically, but then it becomes second nature. Honestly, for me, after about two weeks, I, I didn't even notice I was on Zoom all day uh, anymore. There you go, fascinating. All right, moving on to, to another topic here. So when more and more jobs go remote, do you think there are still any advantages for folks working at tech hubs like San Francisco, Seattle, Palo Alto, et cetera? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. So thanks, thanks to Anonymous for asking it. Um, I was definitely the type of person, I was born and raised in Boston and started my tech career there. And I was always drawn out to San Francisco because I kind of viewed it as the major leagues. I was definitely one of those people. Um, but I've been kind of completely turned around on that front. And, you know, I used to say when I interviewed people of, you know, we think remote work is the future. By the time my kids uh, enter the workforce in 20 years, LA and San Diego will have merged into a giant mega city and everyone will have five hour commutes and we'll have to work remote. But then a couple of things have happened. One, um, uh, I met a, a young woman named Emily, who's on our chief of staff's team. We are her second job and her first job was all remote. So she's never been to an office in her life. And that made me think, wow, this is happening not in the 20 year time frame, but it's starting to happen right now. And then also this unbelievable black swan pandemic happened, which is kind of the ultimate forcing function for remote work. And it's making me think that the, the benefits of being in a place like Seattle or San Francisco that you highlight could dissipate surprisingly fast. And so I, I've definitely seen those benefits of, you know, for the price of a cup of coffee, once I built my network here, I could go talk to the person who architected Apple iCloud or something like that. And you can only do, do that in those certain cities. But I think um, it's not gonna take 20 years. I think it could happen by this summer in, in some ways where uh, you know, a lot of people are gonna be working in tech and have access to these jobs uh, and won't need to be geographically located. And that'll be better for people, it'll be a better for the, for the environment and all those types of things. But I see Darren has some, some thoughts here. So Darren, you wanna chime in? Yeah, uh, I'm actually really optimistic about the future and I think it's gonna be a win-win. The cities that you mentioned right now are way oversubscribed. The public transit can barely handle it. The public services are maxed out. Uh, they could actually use a reprieve. And I think the second order of this happening is when leases come up for renewal in places like Seattle and San Francisco, people are going to kind of collectively look at each other and think, you know, I just spent the last four months doing my job. I spent more time with my family. I spent less time commuting, had more time to exercise, to rest, to read, to meditate, whatever it may be. Should I really be spending this huge sum of money renewing a one bedroom apartment when I can clearly do this job from anywhere. And now my company has actually laid some remote infrastructure to make it even easier for us to do that. So a lot of people are gonna consider smaller mid-sized towns where there's better air quality, better schools for their children, way lower cost of living. And I think the key tenant here is the default work location is gonna to start to flip, the 80-20 rule. Right now, you see a lot of people spending 80% of their time in the office and then you need a special occasion to stay home the cable company is coming or you need to pick up your kid early from school, something like that. I think that notion is going to flip where the default work location will be home or wherever you want to be, co-working space, it doesn't matter. And then the 20% will be reserved to flying to the office for a very special occasion. If you have a big contingent of 
cohorts coming in from a different region or a big business opportunity, you want to wine and dine in the office, something like that. Once that shift happens, uh, you'll see, see people kind of unlock their imagination and think, well, if I can decouple geography and work, what does that mean for me? What could life look like if I did not have to be here in that city? And I think the third order of that is you look at a place like San Francisco, so many actual San Franciscans have been displaced from their own home and their own community. They will, in theory, be able to move back in as some of these other people leave, and they'll be able to strongly invest in the community that matters to them. So I think it's a win for the big cities, and it's a win for the people that are only in these cities because of their vocation. That's, that's fascinating. So speaking as somebody who's been in, you know, Silicon Valley slash San Francisco for the last 15 years, I actually everything that, that you both have shared resonates with me in terms of kind of the evolution of where things are going there. I mean, if you think about it, the reason why people work in a physical location, the, the set of reasons why people work in a, the same physical location are fairly limited. And as technology progresses, that set of reasons, you know, kind of goes down that said, there will always be a set of reasons, you know, kind of regardless of what our technology and everything looks like, there will always be a set of reasons to come in person until, you know, we have, I don't know, the purely virtual, like you actually feel like you're physically there, maybe, I don't know. But, um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, there, there's going to be a set of cities that do what you described, Darren. And, and at the same time, there are, you know, like places like San Francisco, where, you know, people aren't really building a lot of additional housing, like, like maybe needs to be done we may not see as much improvement as places where, you know, building additional housing is possible, but it, at least in the past few weeks, um, yeah, I've certainly seen anecdotally a lot of evidence of people for, you know, since a lot of people are getting laid off, a lot of people are leaving, uh, you know, and, and thinking about how can they, you know, get a, get remote work um, for which there are way more opportunities now, especially challenging. We don't know how, how long this is going to, going to last. So you know, some really great thoughts from, from, from both of you. Um, moving on, how do you handle some of those tough conversations without the benefit of being face-to-face -face or in person to be able to benefit from things such as body language, et cetera? So this kind of ties in a little bit to, uh, to some of the, the, the burnout stuff that we're talking about and kind of detecting, uh, detecting that. But in general, like, you know, body language is, is certainly a huge part of communicating. Some, some studies say that it's, you know, 80%, 90% of communicating. So, so how do you handle some of those, those tough conversations? Yeah, I think um, the, the answer is pretty easy for me, which is, again, after more than two and a half years doing this, um, I don't think it, it makes a difference once you're, you're really used to it. I mean, especially when you, when you hire and onboard and work with people and it's all remote, you kind of don't, you never have those things. You can't rely on them. And so you build your relationships uh, without them but that, as I mentioned like after about two weeks the being on zoom that notational bias just kind of faded in the background and I'll say I've had the very common experience and a lot of people at GitLab say the same thing which is you meet someone in person finally whether at a, a marketing event or our annual employee conference and you can't actually remember if it's the first time you've met them in person before um, and it's a really sort of remarkable experience and it tells you um, that you can form you know fully uh, realized relationships without ever interacting in person. And then the other remarkable thing that happens in person is that the, the only thing I've seen that ever shakes you out of that is when you realize someone is either way taller or way shorter than you're expecting. And then you're like, oh, wait, I definitely never encountered this human before because, you know, Jakob Vossmeyer in the Netherlands is like a giant on our end and you, you don't realize that. The webcam is sort of the ultimate leveler. And that's interesting to me because there's, there's actually a pretty strong height bias. Uh, that, that people have. I think in the U.S. we've elected the taller person every presidential election since they were televised in the Nixon-Kennedy debates, and it's not necessarily the best way to pick a leader. Uh, and so in some way, shape, or form, we might be, uh, we might be somewhat immune to that, that hype bias, which is kind of a neat thing I've learned here. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, Gila, you said you were the, the, you have the shortest tenure here, so you were maybe managing in-person people the most recently. Have you noticed uh, that it's different or the same uh, since you've gotten here? Yeah, I think I, I, I got some good tips from talking with uh, more tenured GitLabbers. I think there are two that are more, most helpful for me. The first one is working with a remote team. You have to be very intentional in terms of building a personal relationship because we don't have that working in the same space, bounding experience. Um, we all start remote. So what I begin to do is in some of our weekly team meeting, we actually intentionally um, 
reserve the first 10 or 15 minutes uh, for something called the social question. So it's a, it can be a really silly or random question like, what type of food do you uh, hate but most other people like? What is the best advice you've been given? And all the team members begin to participate. I, I noticed that made it make a big difference because otherwise we jump into work, we begin to talk about um, ticket, tickets or epics or, or things. Um, we never form that uh, real relationship. We never know what's this person like um, in person. So I think that helps because when you build that strong personal relationship, you have that foundation uh, for any kind of tougher conversation. Um, the other thing I learned is uh, to be really transparent and honest with your team members. Um, set the expectation early on. Uh, I'm going to be very transparent. If I have feedback, I'm going to be very direct. Uh, I think those type of conversation early on will help set expectation from both sides and um, minimize the, the um, kind of lack of body language or human interaction part. That's fascinating. And, and you know, you were, um, we were chatting before about burnout. We had a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a chat on the side. I would love to hear your, your reflections as they relate to, to burnout as well. Yeah. It's kind of relevant to this topic. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think that's the, one of the biggest learning in my four, first four months here. How do you award that? Because now you work from home and remotely, there is not that natural transition of you need to get up, get ready, drive to your work, and then you drive back from your work. You can, you can listen to podcast, kind of the work day is down, you're going to home, right? So um, what I have been uh, experimenting also, I learned this from more tenured GitLab members, is that you have to have an exit plan um, at the end of the day. So something you can design as a routine that mark the, the official end of your work day and the start of your after work day. So before pandemic, I was going to yoga uh, every after, afternoon around five and using that hour to kind of transition out. Now it's much harder. So I'm trying to figure out what's that, what that is. Um, but I think that's super helpful. Um, kind of related to that in addition to design your exit plan. You, some other thing I, I find helpful is design my kind of morning routine and really identify what are the one, two things I want to focus on and achieve today. I think the morning routine and exit plan are really helpful because it put this artificial um, boundary both mentally and also physically um, to distinguish the two between each other. That is so, so wise. And it's something that I did as well. And, and commonly exercise can be one of those things to bound it with, right? Speaking as somebody that, that uh, has been a spin instructor on, on, on nights and weekends up until the, the pandemic started, I've, I've kind of had that same kind of structure separated, but then have also not had that, right? And then I find that, oh, I'm going to six o'clock, I'm going to seven o'clock, maybe I'm going to eight o'clock, and then maybe I feel a little bit of, of resent about working too hard or, or who knows what. So having that artificial uh, separation and creating that consciously seems really important. And this is actually a, a theme that, that I've heard from not only this group, but from, from other uh, conversations prior of the need during uh, remote times uh, to consciously carve out things that sort of naturally exist in the, the normal environment, right? Consciously carving out, like you were mentioning, the social, the social conversation at the beginning of your meetings, consciously carving out the end time, you know, having that, that end exit plan, um, consciously carving out like what you're doing before the start time, you know, creating boundaries. If you're not conscious and explicit about that, a lot of these things don't form naturally and organically the way that, that we expect. So for new managers, kind of having not done this before, there may be a question of like, why does this really matter? Like my job is just to get work done. My team's job is just to get work done. Um, a great book just kind of in that context is Radical Candor that talks about the, you know, challenging folks directly as well as caring about them personally. And why does it matter? Well, if you want your team members to actually reveal when they're having a struggle, reveal when they're having an issue that they need to surface to you, having trust is incredibly important in doing that. And if you don't have that trust, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So, so uh, that's really, I think, a uh, great insight, Hila. Um, moving on, I love how GitLab has their OKRs and strategy entirely public. 
Any tips on how to encourage alignment in a remote team to keep everyone going in the same direction? Yeah, this is a, this is a good one. And, and in particular, as you grow, it gets harder and harder. You get more people. Uh, when I joined GitLab, I think we were 200 people and now we're 1,200 in about a little over two and a half years. So this is, there's been different answers to this question all along that in your three-year tenure. Um, I think OKRs are the primary answer. Alignment is one of the, the really important functions of OKRs if you're doing them well. Um, so for instance, right now we're kind of at the uh, end of month, end of quarter, management especially is spending a lot of time on the next set of OKRs for our next quarter. We're, we're offset one month, so our fiscal quarter is actually ending at the end of April. Um, and um, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, we use our iteration value, we draft them, we socialize them, you get input, you change the draft, and over time you see they sort of, they sort of stabilize or they ask them to, then you know, these are the right things. Um, we're in such a dynamic industry though, and things are moving so fast to GitLab that we're also very flexible at our OKRs. If you get to mid-quarter and the business or something tells you you need to be doing something different, we just change them. We don't, we don't stick to goals that don't make sense anymore. Um, we also use uh, KPIs in conjunction with, uh, with OKR. So we're, we're, uh, as we scaled, we learned like at, at our volume of people, we kind of have an imperative to, to use metrics to manage to a large extent, the things that can be measured at least. Um, and so we have performance indicators and we have key performance indicators and then we have OKR. So uh, an example would be like SLAs and support. Support is part of engineering at GitLab. Uh, and if SLAs are at 90%, but the goal is 95%, we might take on a quarterly OKR to raise that KPI from 90 to 95%. But if that KPI is at 95%, we don't need to do an OKR against that. That's just something we know we need to be good at and that KPI will keep us honest quarter over quarter over quarter. So it's kind of how they, they interact. Um, but Christy might have an interesting perspective here because UX is kind of always and forever between executive and the development groups and the product groups. And in particular, design, of course, has some stuff that can't be measured. It's instinctual. And so I'm curious to get her perspective on alignment and, and metrics and things. Yeah, I, I think for us, part of what I've learned over the last year is um, having, I'm going to call it shared OKRs. And what I mean by that is um, having agreement from your cross-functional partners to have OKRs that are connected to each other has been really, really important. Um, because as designers, we can find problems and we can solve them, but we're not the ones who are controlling the resources who are implementing them. So we've really got to have buy-in from our partners to make meaningful difference in an OKR. Um, and you know, it, it took us a little while to find a groove on that. We tried it at first, it didn't quite work out for a quarter or two. And now I think we actually are falling into a rhythm where we're finding the right type of objectives, the right types of uh, key results within our own OKR to make sure that they align with our partners. Um, and so that's, that's gone. I think that's gone pretty well. The other thing is we do try and find OKRs that are just solely within the control of the UX department. So we like to try and have a balance between those things. So some things are shared and we know that they're part of a common goal towards the product. Other things are things we go, no, this is our thing. We're the ones who can make an impact here. We're going to own it and we're going to make a difference. There you go. So having coordination and, and having shared goals certainly can be impactful, but also just having goals. I mean, you, you'd probably be, I don't know how surprised you'd be, but there are probably a lot of people on this call who are like, no, we don't do OKRs at our company. We don't really even do a lot of goal setting. We're just kind of like figuring out, particularly at startups, just figuring out what we're doing. We're being reactive to what customers are saying, right? But having some kind of goal planning, no matter what stage or size you're at is, is critical. The other thing that this ties into, again, getting back to burnout and like getting work done and staying motivated while remote is like, you may have these goals, but how do, how do you keep your team being motivated towards those goals? I, just one commentary regarding motivation, right? There's kind of two, two different types of motivation out there, right? There's intrinsic motivation and ex extrinsic motivation, right? Intrinsic motivation is being motivated by things that are like more meaningful, right? Things like love or meaning and purpose, right? Extrinsic motivation is more like, you know, uh, carrots, you know, carrots on a stick trying to get to the end of a, you know, an onboarding flow or something, right? So if you find that you're, you're, mo you're lacking motivation or people on your team are lacking motivation, it's good to reflect on, you know, is there intrinsic motivation there? And if the answer maybe is no, one strategy of doing that is this kind of intersecting, just like, like Chrissy was commenting on sort of the shared collaboration. There's also this intersection between, between, for example, having engineers listen to user studies or even sales conversations, right? Give them 
perspective of what is the impact of the work that they are doing. Just a hint of that once in a while can remind people about the why that they're doing something and give them motivation. So, so, so that's great. Um, all right, next, can you speak about recruiting engineering leadership, e.g. Uh, EMs and directors? In my experience, distributed recruiting for ICs relatively far uh, more mature than recruiting for leadership roles. So, so, mu so much of the latter seems driven by in-person networking. Yeah, so this is, um, this is another great question. And, and I'd be lying if I said we haven't seen the geography kind of zoom into the, to the Bay Area and other tech hubs um, when we look for more and more senior roles. Um, going back in time, I get people like myself were, were driven to those geographies and upturned our lives to get there. And that is still the case. However, um, you know, if you rely on in-person uh, networking in general, let alone in-person networking, um, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're going to zoom into those geographies, the people, the salaries are going to be more expensive, and your diversity is going to take a, a major hit. People tend to network, people like them, uh, for better or worse, and uh, that's something where I think you just have to acknowledge the current state and then come up with strategies to mitigate that stuff. So one of the most powerful things we do is we rely on active sourcing of candidates. We do, we do less referral hiring than I've ever seen at either, any other company here. And I was concerned at first when I joined, but that is not the best way to hire, you know? Because um, I think referrals are proven to stay longer at startups and to be higher performers. However, they've got those downsides that I mentioned. So we've invested in a, in a, um, a very healthily, healthily sized uh, recruiting team. And we've set the expectations, particularly when we're in those times of explosive growth, like. 100% growth in 2018, 130% growth in 2019 for engineering. Um, set expectations with managers, hey, you're gonna spend 40% or more of your time recruiting. We need to be an organization that is built to grow. And we did that. Um, and now that we're not growing as fast anymore, we, uh, we can spend more time on investing in those, uh, in those individuals. But active sourcing is really the way that you can um, uh, change that pool of candidates that you're considering for a job. Uh, in intentional ways, and then uh, you know you hire the best person, and you'll you'll see your, yourself improve whatever uh, composition of the team you're looking to improve, while still remaining a meritocracy, which is really important to everybody. Um, but Mac might have perspective here. He's built almost our entire quality team from scratch, and has pretty remarkable gender diversity and uh, location diversity on his team. I think he's personally added like five countries to uh, to GitLab's list. So I'm curious to get uh, his thoughts on what made him successful doing that. Well, thanks, Eric. So we exclusively design our interview process to be like how you're working with the team. And um, for us, it's test automation. And we identified scenarios that won't actually be done, uh, but it's done somewhere else. But it won't actually be something running in production. So nobody can go in and take a look at the answer. It's like a, it's going to be a question forever. But everyone's supposed to be going into the workflow, working closely with the team, and then submitting work as if you were working as a GitLab team member. And that, that has helped a lot. Um, the next one is a, a, a behavioral uh, social call with a, almost like a panelist of two engineers getting to know them, what are the challenges that you've seen before and getting to know the team. And um, I think these two really helped. Um, we also experimenting with, um, in terms of recruiting, um, is to have video recordings for um, the hiring team. So when someone applies, they actually can watch the recording and get to know us before we meet them. So when the call starts, um, the ice has already been melted. It hasn't been broken. It may have been broken, but get started on, on getting to know them better and then getting to know you better. That's it, well, it's really uh, great to hear just the servicing of the topic of, you know, diversity, inclusion, inclusion, equity, access, especially as it relates to hiring and the idea of it. Uh, most people are used to recruiting from their network because that's kind of the easiest thing. And like the truth is oftentimes you can get uh, a high volume inbound for which you feel like you're just wading through resumes that are largely not relevant. Right. And at the same time, you know, I think m hopefully many folks on this call are familiar with the research that when you take two resumes that have identical content, but one of them has the, a name that, that elicits the image of a white man versus uh, one that, that elicits um, the image of a black woman, that the, the black woman actually gets some, something like 60% fewer phone calls for identical content on the same resume, right? So the, the other thing we all have to acknowledge is that we have a significant amount of unconscious bias, right? And that's just an example. This is just what studies say, right? And there's a lot of research about the benefits of diversity and inclusion as it relates to um, both team and group 
work as well as actually group dynamics. I'm actually, um, my alma mater, Carnegie Mellon, there's a researcher there, Anita, Anita Williams Woolley, who uh, did some studies around gender, gender diversity and, and group intelligence, collective intelligence of groups, and looked at the various gender makeups and their abilities to, to solve problems and, and sort of be measured on their collective intelligence. And what they found was that it actually wasn't, uh, you know, looking at all the different types of combinations of men and women, it actually wasn't half men and half women that was the most intelligent. And they weren't all equally intelligent as groups. Actually, the one that stood out from all the others that was the, the most intelligent was majority women. So check out the research on that. I think it's a fascinating one, something to, uh, to keep in mind. So uh, switching gears, and we have about 20 minutes, we're gonna be moving to a little bit more of a lightning round-esque, you know, so aiming for like 15 to 30 second kind of quick, because we got 37 questions. That we're not gonna be able to answer them all, but how do managers detect slash manage an underperforming employee in a remote environment? Yeah, this is, um, uh, this is tricky, similar to burnout. Um, we do try to uh, focus on metrics as much as possible. That makes it uh, empirical. Not everything can be measured, not everything's quantitative, but you, I think, have to at least make a try. Um, we do, if you Google GitLab performance indicators, you'll see a bunch of them in our handbook. I do wanna highlight that we, we, a lot of them end in like something, something per engineer, you'll see that. Um, but I want to highlight that we don't actually focus on individual metrics. We focus on team metrics because you want to incentivize those collaborative behaviors like, hey, I'm busy, but uh, I'm going to review your code, even though it's your unit of work, because we're all on the same team. If you over optimize for individual metrics, you accidentally incentivize selfish behaviors. The reason why we have per engineer is, again, because we were growing so fast. If we didn't control for how fast we were growing, it's like, oh, of course, we're doing more stuff. We doubled our team. Are we actually getting more on average? But I, I just want to have that we do not look at individual metrics. That's sort of an agile worst practice, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. So the um, other thing I've, I've heard a lot about when, when we think about folks who are either underperforming or for which there's concern, besides like just being incredibly transparent about what's going on, because otherwise people just end up getting surprised, is performance improvement plans, or some organizations call them success plans, to be able to manage when things aren't necessarily going as well as they should. So you have clear guidelines and expectations for like where people should go, right? Yeah, we've got performance improvement plans, we've got performance development and plans for different uh, situations. We definitely believe in, in documenting everything, take that for granted in every answer you hear from, uh, from GitLab or that we document stuff. Um, and you know, regular conversations between those, those managers and, and, and managees. Yeah, docu I mean, I love that that's art, part of your, your guys' already ethos and culture. It's, that's something that everybody can and should absorb, like documenting, particularly in these remote environments when we're all asynchronous. So, so that's great. Um, all right, this next question, we already see there's a lot of chatter. Can, can an introvert hold a management position? I'm actually going to try and answer this one question uh, quickly with the group, which is raise your hand, panelists, if you identify as an introvert. <laughs> there you go. Hopefully that answers your question enough, right? So uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, but just to say, yes, it's possible. Um, and I will add that like one of the nice things about being in all remote org is that when you do have to do the scariest thing about being an introvert, get up in front of 500, 1,000 people, with, with Zoom and video conferencing, it never feels like that. It always feels like you're looking at that kind of Brady Bunch view of like eight or nine people or something like that. And so uh, you can definitely manage a scale here without, without having to necessarily directly confront that, that public speaking thing that holds a lot of people back. There you yeah. go. And I left some links in the document, but it's actually way more possible in a remote environment. If you don't have to rely on that charisma, that aura that gets a lot of people through in the office, um, then you can focus more on results. And so it actually removes the bias part of that. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. All right, this is an interesting one. I'm curious about compensation for those that move from one location to another or hiring someone in a new country. Do you use an index based on geography? What level of granularity do you focus on, city, state, country, et cetera? Yeah, so we pay, um, the way to think of our compensation philosophy is we pay um, market rates. Um, we definitely hired a dedicated compensation specialist. In fact, we have two now way earlier in a company's life cycle than you normally would because we've taken on a lot of complexity around compensation to do this. The net effect, though, is we have about double the number of engineers for our payroll than a company that's based in downtown San Francisco. And when we do it right, we create win-wins where people are living you know, where they grew up, where they want to live, and they are uh, paid, compensated very well compared to their neighbors. Um, and yet from a balance sheet, from a company perspective, it's, a, it's another win. So that's win-win. 
Um, when people transfer, you do go through a process where uh, you're, you're paid the, the local rates. Um, and uh, there's a lot, you know, we could do a separate AMA about this and we could bring Brittany and Morgan and they could talk about this for several, several hours is all I'll say. It's definitely one of those things if you're going to do all remote, like all remote is a huge net strength of GitLab. Not everything gets easier though. This is definitely one of those things that gets more complicated. And I see other questions down below around entities and countries and things like that. Yeah, there's a ton of complexity around trying to work and be compliant and operate legally in every country around the globe if possible. Totally. I, as, as somebody who had a team in Argentina, my last role at doctor.com, a CTO there, I, I, and then having folks in other places, right? There's, there's all sorts of crazy laws that you have to deal with. I mean, in Argentina, for example, they have a law that if you, once you fire somebody, you have to back pay them like relative to how long they've been with the company. So there are all these di disincentives to, to let people go. But the, I mean, the, the core, I think, rationale that Eric, I think you're alluding to is like, there's a different cost of living, which is, you know, creates a necessity to, to, to pay a market rate relative to, relative to where people live, right? So, great. Um, moving on, what are the most important behavior changes needed to make remote management work? Yeah, and, and Darren has put in a bunch of helpful links, so I encourage people to, to read. Um, thinking back to my time, uh, having been a remote manager at a non-remote company and then coming to GitLab, I think some of the most important things that come to mind are really unlearning previous cultures, like, you know, unlearning that habit of, of not trusting people unless you see them working or something like that. And um, unlearning that the idea that you need body language to manage people effectively and those sorts of things. So I think it's just kind of uh, uh, trusting and, and stepping into it and seeing that it, it can work um, and, uh, uh, and doing that as quickly as possible um, are, are really, really to me, it's, it's like the uh, parts that I built up that were removed through the course of doing this, that I think were the most, uh, most significant. Um, Gila highlights uh, hiring the right type of person. That's a, that's a great one. We have remote capable as a must have for every hire that's made in engineering. And it doesn't necessarily mean they've been in an all remote organization before. It's just that they've done enough on that spectrum of, of remote work uh, where we think they can be, uh, they, they can be successful. Awesome. Uh, in a setting where most of your colleagues are in the same time zone, how can we establish a culture that allows people to flexibly manage their working hours e.g. allowing treatment of kids during the day. Meetings are particularly complicated for me, this person writes. Yeah, so we, we don't do this, but I totally get the, the problem. Um, we don't optimize for when work arrives in any 24 hour period. And that allows, as I mentioned before, someone in San Francisco to work with someone in India fairly seamlessly once they're both using async. But it also allows for someone in central Russia to work with someone in Europe because they like to sleep in and work in the afternoons. And so we have all kinds of, besides where people live, we have all kinds of interesting uh, working arrangements that people use. Some people wake up and work four hours take four hours in the middle of the day and, and teach their kids and then work four hours in the evening. Whatever works for them, whatever fits with their metabolism, we're able to support. Um, I think if you're within the same, same time zone, there's gonna be that tendency to wanna do a core hour sort of thing. Um, and I don't, I'm not gonna be so strong or opinionated to say don't do that, but just know that it's gonna lock you into people having much, much less work life uh, flexibility. And I'm a startup person. I've only ever worked for startups. This is my fifth one. And I'll say it's much easier to get a haircut or do a dentist appointment at GitLab than any other place I've worked by far. Um, I, so believe, I, I encourage our model. I believe that. This is interesting because I've gone from one, one model and now with my, with my current startup, I'm in another one, right? So starting with this kind of come, come and go as you, as you see and need. And a lot of the, the, the group was remote. Now starting this new company, actually, and this is my, my co-founder was a uh, head of product at Carta and at Carta in the early days. And in fact, still to this day, they, they had every single person, you know, having like 9 a.m. meeting every day to get aligned and in sync and, and checking in and then have, you know, have these, these working hours. It, it's definitely something I see many companies have a strong opinion on and it goes one way or the other. So one has to be mindful of, of what, your team is doing and what your your company is doing and, and what the requirements are there. So that's that's an interesting one. Uh, can you walk through how the directly responsible individual DRI system works for product or feature development? That is what product managers and engineering managers slash technical leads in GitLab are responsible for. Also, is the DRI system tied to performance bonuses or any other systems? Um, yeah, so I think 
maybe what I'll cover is why the DRI thing exists. I think as companies grow and as they get more successful, it's natural to become sort of a consensus-based organization. And uh, we feel like that would, one, slow us down, and two, it's very difficult to work in a distributed fashion um, when you, you have to have everybody kind of like a face-to-face -face on a Zoom to make a decision. And so identifying a DRI is about, um, okay, who's, um, who can uh, pick up the rest of the company on, and put us on their shoulders and make the right thing happen, get the right result. Um, and it's up to that person to um, get the input that they need. And if they're not doing that, that's, they're not gonna be successful in getting the right result. Uh, but they also get to make the decision. And so it's not a, a committee decision. And so it's our attempt to kind of um, split the difference between um, something where people are just acting unilaterally and doing the wrong thing. And the other end of the spectrum where everything is a committee and therefore nothing can happen, no, no decisions are made. Uh, but maybe Christopher can kind of cover in brief how that works amongst uh, engineering managers, leads, and, and PMs. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to pull apart the question a little bit because I'm not sure which question they're asking. But um, you know, the way to think of it is, is in our case, our DRIs uh, on the product management side are around prioritization and what things we actually go into the product. And we have a pretty strict policy within the company of 100% prioritization by product management for engineering. Uh, but engineering owns the definition of done, meaning work isn't completed until until we reach the definition of done. So we, we want to make sure it's thorough and complete solution from that perspective. So there's this healthy tension between those two aspects to basically say, okay, let's work out to make sure that we're we're getting things down to uh, the essence of what we're trying to deliver or associate with it. So. Um, you know, in our particular case, we found it really works well because there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with those two individuals and they have uh, um, not competing, but collaborative, you know, working goals that they are essentially are getting. So that gives us the best opportunity for product, uh, so good product solutions. There you go. Um, all right, moving on. What does a head of remote do? So I'm guessing, Darren, this is directed directly at you. Uh, a lot. I'm going to put some links down there, some interviews that I've done. Uh, my role cuts across marketing, people, operations, uh, pretty much every aspect of the company. The one common thread amongst all of our departments is everyone's remote. Finance is remote. Marketing is remote. Engineering is remote. So I help people acclimate. I help people onboard. I, I work with our onboarding team to make onboarding better. I work to make sure our values are reiterated, that people understand and have what they need to thrive in a remote environment. And I'm responsible for the all remote section of our handbook. So building out our open source library of education to help other companies do remote better. We firmly believe that the rising tide lifts all boats and we see all remote hiring is a major competitive advantage for us right now. But part of our legacy is going to be how fast we can help diminish that. We want us to be the norm, not the exception. And so we're doing all that we can uh, with the community to share what we've learned to empower other companies to do this as well. That's awesome. Consciously carving out like what is your remote culture? What are the tools that you're using? Like, again, acknowledging that a very common theme with remote work is, again, you have to consciously carve out things that were otherwise organic in person. I, I admit this is actually the first time that, I, that I've known a company that has a, a dedicated role to this, but everything you just said, it, it makes a ton of sense. It's very, very yeah. cool. And you got to realize that people are coming in bringing all sorts of other organizational baggage. They've done things for maybe 20, 30 years. And we do things very distinctly, very intentionally, very differently at GitLab. And a lot of it feels like a trap. So I have to work with people to ensure that they know it's not a trap. We do operate with no ego, with short toes, with blameless problem solving. All of the things that you read in our values, we actually believe it and we do it. And we have to make sure that as we scale, everyone believes that so that we maintain what it is that we are even as we grow larger. There you go. Fascinating. We have a few more minutes left, so I'm going to gonna continue to lightning round it. I've heard a few times that fully remote slash distributed teams are easier to manage than mixed teams where some portion of members are remote and others usually work from, from one or two offices. What are the things that commonly go wrong with the mixed teams and what can be done to mitigate these things? Yes, yeah, so I've, I've done the mix thing two companies ago. I was the only remote manager at a very much on-premise company. It was a unique privilege for me, it allowed me to meet my wife and marry her, so I'm thankful for it. But it was all on me to make sure there were no where's Eric moments. And I was told that by a senior manager and I, I had to take that very seriously. And I remember having to develop habits like chat someone five minutes before every single meeting or they would forget about me and forget to turn on the video conferencing system. And so that was hard. It was, it was invaluable for my personal life, but it was, it was a very difficult situation. So I think on-premise is easy because again, you can kind of lean on the office as a crutch. 
and all the ways we described before. And remote only or all remote is um, also very easy. And in between there's a trough, it's kind of a danger zone. And um, moving from on-premise to remote as everybody has been forced to do, I think crossing that, that chasm for lack of a better term could actually make you say, oh, this isn't working and go and fall back to on-premise. And so I usually encourage companies that are thinking about it, just kind of go in and, and do the all remote thing and it'll, you actually have an easier time. But from companies that are, are successful connecting to offices or doing some kind of hybrid remote thing, I do hear tips like if you're doing a, like a meeting, um, make everybody treat it as a remote meeting. In other words, people in the office, have them all zoom in as individuals and prevent that feeling that there's a subculture or, or something uh, that the remote, truly remote people don't have access to or aren't taking part in. I, and I experienced you know, remoting into a meeting and everybody's already laughing about some inside joke that was discussed out at the lunch table or something like that. Those subtle things are what make people feel disconnected or, or unwelcome and also leads to lack of documentation and things because you can just rely on the fact that everybody heard something, but in reality, no, half your org didn't hear that. Um, so, uh, so we don't do that, but I'm, I, I've done it before and I encourage you to just think, think all remote, try to push through what feels like a reasonable iteration towards all remote and really just try to do it do it uh, all in. Yeah, it makes sense. Having kind of been in similar environments, I know that if you're on the other end and you're in the minority on the remote side, you have to speak up for yourself, right? If the, the video conferencing system is so shitty that you can't actually hear people over clapping, you have to surface that. If you felt left out because something started 10 minutes late and everybody was already talking and you couldn't join until, you know, you have to surface all of that stuff. So, um, you know, the resonates with me as well. It can be a lot more of a challenge. So uh, we, I'm going to take one more question. Uh, so it seems like many strategies for making remote teams work heavily rely on written communication. Not everyone starts out with great writing skills and some specifically struggle with writing or reading. What can a manager do to encourage everyone on a team to level up on their writing skills? Yeah, so um, we, we talked earlier about selecting for all remote, which is something we can do now because there's only so many all remote companies. Um, so that's one of the things we select for is reading and writing skills. And in some ways, the, how the person navigates the hiring process, like communicating back and forth by email with their recruiter is a proxy for how successful they're going to be at a company like ours. But if all remote work is the, the future for a number of industries, and we believe it is, um, you do need to be successful with different types of people that we're not necessarily so intentionally selecting for now, like um, young people just exiting college that don't have a profes any professional experience, a little bit of remote professional experience. We're doing a remote internship program this year to kind of um, crack that onboarding uh, issue. And we do have some people um, kind of along the lines of the question that was asked that maybe English isn't their first language. And so we provide um, uh, speaking and writing training uh, for those individuals. So there may be someone where English is their first language, but they're not as comfortable in those things. The same types of the programmings and, and learning and development training would probably probably help out. There you go. That's awesome wisdom. Well, we are right on time. So Eric, I want to thank you so much, as well as Darren Gila, Christy, Mech, Christopher. This was fantastic and actually a model I think we want to do again. It's kind of a, an experiment to see if a group would work. I think it works quite well. Everybody has some really awesome, significant wisdom. So thank you all for sharing your, your wisdom and, and I hope that you all stay safe during these uh, crazy times.